Good morning. Good morning. It's lovely to see everyone that's out this morning. We're a little low on numbers. Uh, as I said earlier at our breaking of bread, I think there's still a number of people enjoying the last of the Easter holiday uh, in a way somewhere nice. And we also have our young people. In case you're looking around the meeting this morning, say, where's all the young people? They're all away and poured it down for the YP weekend. And we'll be praying for them a little later on in our service. Let me particularly welcome this morning uh, our good brother, Lawrence Kennedy. We've been looking forward to Lawrence coming to the meeting over the last while and we've been praying for him. Lawrence, good to see you, brother. Thank you for coming. Good to see Leslie, his wife, with him this morning as well. And we look forward to hearing Lawrence throughout today and over the next uh, coming Sundays in the Lord's will. But it's good to see everybody that's gathered and I trust we shall all be blessed as we sit under the sound of the word of God and lift our hearts and worship the hymn this morning. We're going to begin by singing our opening hymn. It's in the blue hymn book, if you like to use the hymn book. The blue hymn book, number 83, God is here and that to bless us. And we trust that that's the case. And after the introduction from David, we'll stand and we'll sing this hymn together. scripture from the Psalms. Uh, Psalm 85, if you'd like to turn to it. Psalm 85. I'm going to take just a few moments. There's only 13 verses, so we'll take a few moments just to read all of this lovely psalm. Psalm 85. And I notice the title in my Bible over this psalm is God's Past Mercies. 
Psalm 85. Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin, Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Praise God for that. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not restore us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, Lord, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and shall set us in the way of his steps. Amen. And we know that God will bless his word to all of our hearts. Now, as we come to prayer this morning, there are a few things that I would like us to specifically remember as we pray together as an assembly. Uh, we were saddened to hear just uh, on Saturday morning of the passing of our dearly beloved brother, Billy Mitchell. Uh, Billy was a faithful and loyal uh, saint and member of this assembly for many years. Uh, a dear friend of mine and a dear friend of many that are gathered out this morning. And while we rejoice with Billy being in the presence of the Lord that he loved and served, for so long, we do remember uh, fondly and compassionately the family that is left behind. And we particularly remember this morning his children, Ruth, Sharon, Philip, Helen, and of course the rest of the family circle. We'll remember these dear people in prayer. We also have a couple of brethren uh, from the assembly away preaching elsewhere today. Peter Ritchie is at Ballyclare Baptist all day. Ed Wilson is at Rathmore Street, again, morning and evening. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, our young people are in Porta Down for the YP weekend. Danny Roberts from LMI uh, is responsible for speaking there over the weekend. And we'll remember Danny and the young people there in Porta Down. Now let's just take a moment and in quietness come before God and ask him to bless our meeting this morning. Let's pray together. Almighty and eternal God, we come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only name, the only one by whom we have access into your presence. And as we come before you in prayer, we acknowledge that we must do so in faith and also in reverence. For you have told us in your word that you are the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. We acknowledge that this is the God to whom we come before in prayer this morning. And again, we do so in the name of your only begotten, well-beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the outset, our Father, we would thank you for this, another opportunity to gather together on another Lord's Day, to worship the one true God for who you are, for your mercy and your grace, 
for your long suffering toward us and the many blessings, the abundant blessings that you bestow upon us day after day. Again, we would praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom and in whom alone we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. We thank you too for another opportunity to come to this place where the word of God is faithfully read and fearlessly preached. Father, could we ask that you would please bless your word to us this morning. And to that end, we pray very especially for Lawrence as he would take the platform a little later on. We commend him to you, our God. We pray that he may know much liberty of the Holy Spirit as he would read from the word of God and give the sense of it and apply it, we trust, by the power of the Holy Spirit to our hearts. And our Father, we pray that as we would sit under the word of God, that we may have receptive hearts to what you would bring to us this morning. Father, we take a moment to remember those in our assembly who would dearly love to be out this morning but can't be here, be it through reason of illness. And there are those, our Father, in our assembly who are ill, those who are very ill. And we do commend them compassionately into your loving and tender care, praying our God that you would bless each of them according to their individual need. There are those, our Father, who are unable any longer to get out to the meetings because of infirmity through old age. Bless those folk, our Father, we pray. And Father, there are those in our assembly who are going through a difficult time. There are those who are lonely. We would think, our Father, of the number of widows and widowers that we have in the assembly. We pray very tenderly for them at this time. We pray to our God for those in the assembly who perhaps are struggling spiritually and we pray very tenderly for them our God that you would encourage them in their faith bless them in their faith and build them up once again into the strength of a strong vibrant faith Father as we have mentioned a few moments ago we remember with fondness our dear brother Billy Mitchell a faithful servant of yours and a dear friend and brother to each of us in the assembly. Billy has passed into the presence of the Lord and while for Billy it is joy eternal. He is absent from the body. He is present with the Lord Jesus whom he loved and served. He is with Christ which for Billy is far better. But we are mindful, our God, of the family that he has left behind. And so, our God, we bring them before you tenderly and compassionately in prayer this morning. We remember them, our Father, before you. We think of his children, Ruth, Sharon, Philip, and Helen. Bless them, our God. Encourage them, we pray, in these difficult days of sadness and bereavement. Remember the wider family circle and all who knew and loved Billy. Bless, we pray, to the glory of your name. Our Father, we pray for the two men that have went out from us this morning to preach elsewhere. We think of Peter and Billy Clare. We think of Ed and Rathmore Street. Pray, our Father, that you would bless them and we ask for liberty for these two brethren, our Father, as they would preach a little later on. Bless them, our Father, we pray. We thank too of the young people from our assembly uh, away on their weekend. We pray that this will be a time of refreshing physically and spiritually. To that end, our Father, we pray for Danny as he would lead the talks uh, as he speaks to the young people. Bless him, our Father. And we do pray indeed that they may come away from this weekend blessed, encouraged, and built up 
in our most holy faith. And so, our Father, we commit ourselves to you just now. Please shut us in, our Father, with your presence. Make each of us aware, so aware of your presence as we sit under the sound of your word and as we lift our hearts in praise to our God. Hear us, we pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus, and for your glory we pray. Amen. Now, Colin Murray is going to come just now and speak to the boys and girls. Thanks, Colin. Well, good morning for this morning's little story of the boys and girls. I want to bring you a place not too far away from here. Does anybody recognize that flag and know where it is? I'm sure you do. A few blank books. Isle of Man, I think I heard murmur there. Yes, for a few. That's exactly Isle of Man. Now, in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, whatever else, um, many people went there for their holidays. I more or less grew up in the Isle of Man every summer and sort of knew it back to front. And if you're trying to find where it is, there it is in the middle of the REC, not too far away. And if you ever took the boat all those years ago, some of you will remember some of those boat journeys and for all the wrong reasons, pretty horrendous, but there you are, it wasn't too far away. And if you, if you take the next slide, you'll see we close up with the Isle of Man. So if you're sailing the Isle of Man, you'll come down around the bottom, what's called the Calf of Man. You'll come up the right-hand side. And then just with the arrow is you take a left turn into Douglas Harbour. Now in Douglas itself, there's, there's, a, there's a particular statue, which is there, you're going to see it in the next picture, of a man who moved there later in life and who died there and who was buried there. And it was a man called Sir William Hillary. He was born in 1771, so that's almost 250 years ago. And you might say, well, who was he? You have to be do something special in your life to get a statue built up, usually. So what do we know about him? Well, here's a guess, a clue for you before we show you the next slide. There's 46 of these around the Irish coast, from top to bottom all the way around. And if you've been in Newcastle, or Bangor, or Portrush, Donaghadee, you've maybe seen one of these. Does anybody know what it is? I guess if you raised eyebrows, you're afraid to commit. Right, well, there it is it's on the screen. The lifeboats. He was the man many years ago, he was involved in a rescue at sea. And uh, of course, we all know the dangers, particularly back in those days when they didn't have the fancy ships and boats that we have now. And he was involved in this, and he thought, wouldn't it be great if I could get volunteers to man boats? And if ever there's trouble at sea, people could go out and try to rescue people. And so that's what he tried to do. He didn't have much success originally, but he got a lot of rich friends who originally decided to do it, get this going. And 1824, the RNLI, which is the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, came into place. And it's still here today, and many people have been very glad of that and have been saved and rescued from the sea over the years. Well, just as you're turning left into Douglas Harbour, one of the things you see in the boat, if you've been there, in the next slide you'll see it, as a little island, and it's known as the Conister Rock, or St. Mary's Isle. Now, back in those days, there was a the little castle, if you like, that's on it, that didn't, didn't exist, but this was a rock. It was partially submerged, and there were many boats which crashed into that in bad weather. Many lives were lost, and uh, it was a very dangerous place to be. So this man, again, Sir William Hillary, when he saw this, he thought to himself, it would be great if I could put something here for two reasons wanted to build what was called the Tower of Refuge, which you'll see there. Two reasons for it. The first one was it would be a visible warning. So when you turn the corner, instead of seeing a rock that was partially submerged, you'll see this little wee mini castle, if you like, and therefore you'd know that there's danger. But also then, within this little Tower of Refuge, there would be some shelter that kept some blankets and some fresh bread and water for anyone that was stuck, and they could wait there until someone came and rescued them. The next slide is a, a word, again, it's a word fear. And when people go to sea, if you know, if you're in a wee boat, like some of those boats people sailed in years ago that you and I probably would even get into now in bad weather, but if it starts to sink, I would say that's your main thing that comes over your mind, fear. What's going to happen? We're going to drown. We're going to die. Is anybody going to be able to rescue us? So many things that people were concerned about. And that's why this man, William Hillary, when he saw this, he realized that people, when they're in danger, they're filled with fear. And wouldn't it be good to give them some hope that somebody can come and rescue them? Or if they find themselves on this rock, that at least they can stay safe and stay warm until someone comes and helps them. 
The next slide takes us to a very familiar thing. We're thinking about it particularly last weekend, and it's a cross of the Lord Jesus, of course. We know the three crosses that there were. But when we think about that, and we're thinking about the Tower of Refuge, why was the Tower of Refuge built? It was said again, it was a visual warning. And I think the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ is a visual warning as well, because when we look back and we see these three crosses, what it warns us about is this, that sin must be very serious, first of all. If God would send his only son to die on a cross for sinners, then it must be a very serious thing. But the other, the other warning is this, that there were two crosses either side of the Lord Jesus. One man rejected the Lord Jesus and be lost for all of eternity, and the other one accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord said to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. So it stands as a warning that if we don't trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, no matter how much Bible you know, how many times you've attended church, that you could be lost forever. But the second reason was it was going to provide shelter for victims and for those who had helped. And we know today that if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then we can trust in him. We don't need to be filled with fear because we know that the Lord Jesus has taken care of all of our sins. He's paid for them on the cross. And it's a wonderful thing, isn't it, to know that we're safe and we're secure in him. In fact, the next little expression that we see comes up on the screen, fear not, for I am with you. It's not a wonderful thing in life. There will be difficulties for all of us, whatever they may be. And it's not wonderful to know no matter what happens in our lives, that we can always encourage ourselves that we don't need to fear because the Lord himself is with us, with us throughout life, but then he'll be with us in death and take us to be with himself if we know him as our Lord and Savior. And then the final little slide is this. It's a little verse from Proverbs chapter 18. And it says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. And there are many times in life when maybe we just don't know where to turn, what to do, how to resolve a situation. But the Bible tells us that the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run to it and are safe. Isn't it great that we can take everything to the Lord Jesus? And we know that if we're with him, we, he will take care of us, and he'll guide us, and he'll help us in every circumstance of life. So I wonder this morning, question to all of us, whether you're young or you're old, are you trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation? Do you know him as your saviour? Have you run, if you like, to that tower of refuge? And know indeed that he's the one who can help us, the only one who can help us and save us from our sins. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Now I just want to take a few moments to go through the announcements for the week that lies ahead uh, in the assembly. Our next meeting uh, today, the Sunday school and Bible class at 5.20 p.m., uh, early this evening. Uh, our gospel meeting this evening at 7 o'clock when Lawrence Kennedy will be along once again uh, to bring the gospel. And our singer this evening is Rachel Denny. Tomorrow evening uh, we commence a new series of Bible studies. Morris Warburton will be with us on Monday evenings throughout the month of April. Uh, and he's taken up a series of studies that he has entitled Lessons from Lot. He'll be beginning with his first study tomorrow night, and he is entitled it, A Blessed Beginning, uh, taking out the scripture reading, Genesis 11, 27 through to the end of chapter 12. So that's the Bible study tomorrow evening, 8 o'clock. Tuesday, 10, 15 a.m. and 7.45 p.m., the door-to-door -door teams will meet uh, to go around the area. Wednesday at 10 a.m., the ladies' activity morning. All ladies are warmly invited, uh, and both Lorraine and Ruth would be delighted to see as many ladies as possible attending that. Wednesday at 6.30, the children's meeting. Uh, Thursday, 8 o'clock, our assembly prayer meeting. Uh, we're having a visitor along this week, a lady by the name of Catch E. Uh, Nikon Orova, not from Belfast, as you could guess. Kachi uh, is a translator for Christian workers in the Ukraine, and she'll be along, God willing, on Thursday evening to give her a, a brief report uh, on the work and the ministry there that she's involved in. Friday morning, 10 a.m., Mums and Tots, uh, brings us through to Saturday evening, 7.30, uh, 
engage and re-engage. And beginning next Saturday, uh, all from P7, all from Primary 7 will be very welcome and encouraged to attend uh, the engage uh, section of those meetings from 7.30 to 8.30, beginning next Saturday, engage, re-engage. So for those P7s or for any parents uh, that know of, that have P7 children, uh, you could send them along and they would, would love to see them here. That brings us through to next Lord's Day. Uh, 10.30 we meet, as is our practice at 10.30, to break bread and remember the Lord and his death till he come. 11.30, the family service. 7 o'clock, the gospel service, when again, God willing, Lawrence Kennedy will be our preacher at both meetings next week. Uh, just one additional announcement. We have uh, a good body of people in the assembly that uh, week by week uh, would clean the place, keep the place clean, and a good number of cleaning teams but we're always on the lookout for others that would like to help in this. Um, it, w it means coming down uh, for an hour or two, and it would be in around twice a year. So if you would like to volunteer for this, there is a sheet out in the foyer, any of the deacons will point you uh, in the direction of it. Just put your name down, and then the deacons, Dawson Kerr in particular, will tie up with you uh, and keep you informed about that. I think that's all the announcements that I need to make at this present time. And as always, we make them subject to the sovereign will of God. Now, just before Lawrence comes to preach to us, uh, we're going to sing another hymn together. It's in our chorus book this time, number 37 in the chorus book, uh, a piece entitled Redeeming Love. And during the singing of this, uh, the children can leave for children's church and crash. Thank you, David.
to be back in the Iron Hall. I, I don't feel a stranger here. I feel like I'm part of the furniture. Huh? Maybe because my wife was Iron Hall, and that means that I have an affiliation. And then with the choir movement, the male voice choir movement, there was always that affiliation. And so I feel as if I'm, uh, I'm back home in many senses. Thank you uh, for the invitation. Could you turn with me, please, to Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. And we're reading uh, from verse 21 through to verse 35. This is the word of the living God. And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day, he, the Lord Jesus, entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. And at even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed with devils. And all the city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many that were sick of divers diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. And amen. God always blesses the reading of his word. The story is told of a, an executive having a seminar for young budding executives. They were all sitting in the lecture room and the lecturer put a jar on the table and then put six boulders into the jar. And he looked at the young executives and said, well, is it full? And they said, yes, it's full. He says, no, it's not full. And he got pebbles and poured the pebbles into the jar and they fell between the boulders right up to the top. And he says, is it full now? And they said, yes, it's full. He says, no, it's not full. And he got sand and he poured the sand in and the sand fell between the pebbles, between the boulders, right up to the top. He says, is it full now? The, these were young executives that caught on. And they said, probably not. He says, you're right. And he got a jug of water and poured the water in and it fell between the sand, between the pebbles, between the boulders, right up to the top. Is it full now? He says, full now. The lecturer says, what's the lesson? One young lad put up his hand. He says, I know. He says, no matter how full you think your diary is, if you shake things about, you'll always fit something more in. And the lecturer said, no, here's the lesson. If you don't put the big boulders in first, you'll not get them in at all. If you don't put the big boulders in first, you'll not get them in at all. Across our province, believers in Jesus Christ are filling their lives with pebbles and sand and water. Secondary things 
legitimate things, good things, but secondary things. And they have no room for the big boulders that ought to go in first. What are the big boulders? What are the spiritual priorities that must be put in first? Well, over the next three Sunday mornings in with the help of God, I I want to look at three of the big boulders that must be put in the jar first before you start putting in the pebbles and the sand and the water. First things first. This morning, we're going to look at a big boulder, the priority of prayer. It has to go into the jar first. Most believers today find that they don't have time for prayer because they fill their jar with the pebbles and the sand and the water and it's up to the brim and they don't have room. Next week, God willing, we're going to look at the priority of preaching. And then if we're spared to the third week, the 21st of April, I think it is, the priority of persevering. Three Big, essential boulders in the life of every child of God that must get into the jar first. And as we go through these three Sunday mornings together, I want you to tick the box and say, yes, I have that boulder in place. This is far more vital than winning arguments. This is far more important than debating theological controversies. And the theologians love to do that and we spend our time with our pet subjects and sometimes we neglect the boulders that have to go in first or we'll not get them in at all. So prayer, looking up. Preaching, reaching out. And perseverance going on. I think you all would agree with me that those are three boulders. These are three priorities. First of all then, this morning we come to this boulder, this priority of prayer. They say if a preacher wants to convict a congregation, you speak about prayer because it's one of those subjects that we all feel in to some degree. I've been preaching now since I was 17 years of age. That wasn't yesterday or the day before. And I still find I could spend and ought to spend more time in prayer. I love prayer. I love the discipline of prayer. I love that I can soar through the clouds into the very throne room of God. I love it. But but as I prepared for this morning, I hung my head and said, you know, Lawrence, sometimes you don't pray as oft as you should. I want to look at three things with you this morning. This is uh, Sunday school material. I understand that for a congregation here in the Iron Hall. But I want to look, first of all, at the, the priority of prayer. And then I want to look at the power of prayer And then, with God's help, I want to look at the privacy of prayer. The power of prayer. I remember some years ago in Bali Baptist, some of our young people started to wear bracelets. WWJD. What would Jesus do? I thought it was a great idea. I never bought one for myself. I was a wee bit past it at that stage. But a great idea to remind them that they were Christians, and as a witness to others who would ask about it, it was a great idea, but I already know what Jesus would do. Jesus would pray. You see, the Lord Jesus was not only, did not only have a prayer life, he had a life of prayer. And dear saint of God, I say to you, you are never more like Jesus Christ than when you are praying. You say, Lawrence, how can you prove that Jesus had a life of prayer? 
Well, let me take you on a wee walk. I'm turning to Luke's gospel. You don't need to turn if you don't want. I'll read the verses to you. But the first one is Luke 3 and 21. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. So there the Lord Jesus at his baptism prayed. It teaches us that prayer helps us apply biblical truth, helps us to obey truth. The Lord Jesus, as he was being baptized, prayed. Then we turn over a few pages to Luke chapter 6 and we find another thing. We find that before he called his disciples, he prayed. Look at verse 12 of Luke chapter 6. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples and of them he chose 12 whom also he named apostles. So prayer not only helps us apply and obey biblical truth, that was his baptism, but it helps us whenever we're making difficult decisions. The Lord Jesus, before he called his disciples, went into a mountain and spent time alone with the Father praying, and then he called his disciples. And then we move over to chapter 9 and we find the same thing. We find that he prays before his transfiguration. Look at verse 28 and 29. And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistening. And so there again, he prays before his transfiguration, teaching us that prayer helps us to glorify God. And we know in Luke 22, uh, there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prays in the garden before he is arrested and heads to Calvary, teaching us that prayer helps us in the dark valleys and in the difficulties of life. And so we can trace through the life of the Lord Jesus that in the special moments at his baptism, at the time when he chose his disciples, at his transfiguration, and even Calvary, he was a man of prayer. The priority of prayer. I I look on it like this. The Lord Jesus was born once. The Lord Jesus lived once. The Lord Jesus died once. He rose once. He ascended once. But Hebrews 7 tells us today he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Constant ministry of prayer at the Father's right hand. 24-7. He's a man of prayer. Can I say this to you in the iron hall? I have only made it this far. Because Jesus is praying for me. Dear saint of God in the iron hall and those watching online. We have only made it this far. Because there's one in the glory at the father's right hand. And he's interceding on our behalf. He's my advocate. He's my heavenly lawyer. And he's standing for me. We have only made it this far. That crisis we survived. That problem we faced. That sickness we endured. That doubt that slipped in and tripped us up. How did we get through it? He's praying for us. We have an advocate. We have a heavenly lawyer. He is praying for us. The priority of prayer. We see it in the text that we read this morning. And I've read Mark 1, 35, thousands of times. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. I've read it thousands of times. But as I thought of the meeting this morning, it was the build-up that really struck me. We read it this morning. Let's look at it. First of all, 21 
Verse 21, he had a speaking engagement in the synagogue on the Sabbath morning. Straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. So like me coming to the Iron Hall this morning for a preaching engagement, so the Lord went to the synagogue in Capernaum for a preaching engagement. And the Lord would have given the very best to his preaching, of course. Far better than what you have to listen to this morning. But then after the speaking engagement, verse 23, and there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit and he cried out saying, let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth, thou art come to destroy us, I know who thou art, the Holy One of God. After the preaching, a demon-possessed man tried to disturb the service, shouting out, I'm not encouraging you to do it this morning, I'm not equipped for that, huh? It has happened before, but don't do it this morning. But for the Lord Jesus, he's just at the end of his sermon, just at the end of his message, and there's a disturbance in the congregation, and this man tries to disturb the meeting. Verse 23 to 27, he exercised the demon out of this man. It was not easy. Verse 26 indicates a battle, and when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. I say, this is some... Sabbath day, isn't it? He came, he had the preaching engagement, then the disturbance in the meeting, and he deals with that. The Lord is now exhausted, no no doubt. He enters into Simon Peter's house for his dinner. They're discussing the morning service. They're discussing the satanic interference. And then Peter's mother-in-law takes sick, verse 29. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and none they tell him of her. And he came, and he took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. So we had the service in the synagogue. We had a disturbance by a demon-possessed man. The Lord is now exhausted. He goes to the home of Simon Peter for his dinner. His mother-in-law is ill. He deals with that. Verse 32, it's still Sabbath. And at even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils. And all the city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. I say, this was some Sabbath, wasn't it? I mean, I'm having it fairly easy here in the Iron Hall. He came, he had the preaching engagement. There was the disturbance. He went for his dinner. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. And now at sunset, about 4.35 o'clock, all that were diseased, all that were demon-possessed, all in Greek just means all. There's a list a queue going down the street on both sides, waiting their turn. And the Lord Jesus dealt with them at the door of Peter's house. And I tell you this, I have no proof of it, but I don't believe he came to the door and waved his hand over the multitude and says, you're all healed. It's sort of Benny, Benny Hinstein. No, oh, no, 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 no. The Lord Jesus inevitably, when he dealt with individuals, he dealt with them as individuals. And I believe that he missed his dinner. And I believe he spent his time dealing with one after another, after another, as individuals. I believe the Lord dealt with all the sick individually, one to one. I don't know what time it was when he finished. Was it 11 o'clock at night or 12 o'clock at night or 1 in the morning? I don't know. I know the Lord would have been drained and exhausted after such a Sabbath. And then verse 35, and it says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have done it. After such a Sabbath, I would have had a lion. I would have said, the Lord will understand after the day I had yesterday, I need to get my sleep. 
But the Lord Jesus has an appointment with his father. And that was his priority. The theologians tell me that he rose in the fourth watch of the night, which is between three o'clock and six o'clock in the morning. I personally believe it was closer to three than six because uh, Mark records that it was a great while before day. I think it was pitch black. The house is quiet. Everybody's sleeping. And the Lord slips out and goes to a solitary place to pray. Why? Because prayer's a priority. Tell me, dear saint of God in the iron hall, is prayer a priority for you? You see, we live in a day when churches are dying. Where evangelical voice is being silenced. We have a situation where I go across our province and numbers are dwindling. God hasn't changed. But I do believe we need to once again make this a priority. We we need once again to make this the big boulder that goes in first. It has to be a priority personally and collectively as local churches. Dear saint of God, you'll never find the time. You must put the big boulder of prayer in first. Starts tonight. You say to your spouse, we're going to have our tea a wee bit earlier tonight because the prayer meeting's at half six. And even though I can't preach, I want Lawrence to know that I'm standing with him in the pulpit. So I'm coming to the prayer meeting tonight because I want God to move. It starts tomorrow morning when you set the alarm 20 minutes or half an hour earlier than normal to have time to pray before you go out to work. It comes again come Thursday in the normal night for the prayer meeting. I know there's a missionary coming this week, but normally uh, Thursday night I I have to go to the prayer meeting tonight because I need to put that big boulder in first. C.H. Spurgeon arrived at the church office and he said to his secretary, do not disturb me for 30 minutes. I have an appointment with my Lord. And he went into his office and closed the door. A man arrived to see Spurgeon and insisted that Spurgeon be told. And the secretary knocked on the door and said, Mr. Spurgeon, Mr. Balfour is here. And he insists on speaking to you. Spurgeon says, tell him I'll see him in 30 minutes. After a wee while, there was another knock at the door. The secretary again, he says, Mr. Balfour says that he's a big donor And he insists on speaking to you. Spurgeon says, I'll see him in 30 minutes. After a while, there was another knock on the door. The secretary says, Mr. Balfour says this. He's a minister of the cloth. Spurgeon says, I'll see him in 30 minutes. And then again, knock on the door. The secretary says, Mr. Balfour says he's a servant of the Most High God. Spurgeon says, I have an appointment with his boss. I'll see him in 30 minutes. Saint of God, make prayer a priority. Let me move on to the power of prayer. You see, we all know this in theory, without doubt. We quote the verses. We, we know 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And we know that we have the petitions. No, and we know that if he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. I think that's right. And we know John 14, 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. You hear it quoted in the prayer meeting. Nothing seems to happen. Maybe, maybe it's different than they are in the hall. But in the prayer meetings, I've been, we we'll, we'll believe, we we'll pray. What's wrong? Where's the power of prayer? 
In our King James Version of the Bible, 693 references to prayer. But somehow Satan has anesthetized us to its priority and its power and we're left drifting aimlessly along. The other day I was out and my mobile phone started to bleep at me. I thought my wife was looking for me. It wasn't her at all. No, my phone had been too long away from the charger. And the phone was telling me that it was running out of power and I had to get it back on the charger. Eventually, it stopped leaping. The power had gone. Dear saint of God, do you hear the spiritual bleeping? Do you hear the bleeping because we're running out of power and we've lost contact with the charger, the source of power? It's deafening. It's deafening, dear saint of God. And you can give me a thousand reasons why you're not praying. And I'll say, that's fine. And we are left bankrupt. Powerless, voiceless. Prayer is powerful. Prayer builds our relationship with Christ. If you want a closer walk with God? Here it is. Get the big boulder of prayer in. Spend those times talking and communing with the God of heaven and the, 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 in the name of Christ who died for us. Not only does prayer build our relationship with Christ, prayer helps us overcome temptation. We're all susceptible. Let he that thinks he has no sin, eh? truth is not in him. We're all susceptible. Prayer enables us to discern God's will. Prayer is a weapon of spiritual warfare. Prayer is essential to genuine revival. Dear saint of God, it is my conviction that if the church was on, knee, on its knees praying, it would bring heaven to earth. And when we pray according to his will, now that's the key, according to his will. And you need to live close to him to know his will. Do you remember David was longing for a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem? The, the text would indicate that it wasn't even verbal. It was the desire of his heart. Oh, that I would have a cup of the water. And some of his men went on a suicidal mission into the enemy camp at night. And it was one thing getting the water. Imagine trying to get the water back out through enemy lines without spilling it. And they came and they gave it to David. How did they know? I'll tell you, they lived so close to David. They knew the desire of his heart. And David took that water and he poured it out as a love offering unto the Lord. It was too precious. He couldn't drink it. Tell me, do you live that close? Because when we pray according to his will, because we're living close enough to know the heartbeat of God, when we pray according to his will, we're invincible. Maybe I'm not allowed to shout in there at all. We're invincible. When we pray according to the will of God. And not only are we invincible, Satan is defeated. My time is gone. Let me get to number three. We have looked at the priority of prayer. We have looked at the power of prayer. Notice, please, the privacy of prayer. You see, there's three main aspects of prayer, and people get them mixed up. All three are clearly taught in Scripture, and one does not substitute for the other. First of all, there is family prayer, the family altar. Sadly, neglected in our day. Gathering the children round the word of God and praying with them. Family prayer. Secondly, there is public 
or assembly prayer. That is, as priests unto God, we believe in the priesthood of all believers, and as a priest, we bring the saints to the throne of God. As a collective, we're not praying on our own in a prayer meeting. We're bringing the saints to the throne of grace. We're acting as a priest unto God. And so we bring the needs collectively. We bring the worship collectively. We bring our heart collectively, and we present it before the Father as a sweet-smelling savor. That's collective or assembly prayer. But what we have in Mark 1 is different. It's not family prayer, and it's not assembly prayer. This is private prayer. A solitary place. After the busy day of the Sabbath, he gets up a great while before dawn because he's an appointment with his Father. And he prays. In a solitary place. The word for solitary, or emus, it literally means desert. It's the same word as used in verse 12 to speak of spirit drive with him into the wilderness. That's the same word in the, in the original. Now I have a problem with this. You see, we're, we're read in verse 21 that he's in Capernaum. Capernaum's a Galilee. Capernaum is beautiful and lush and green. Lots of farming and fishing. I mean, it's a paradise in, in Capernaum. It's beautiful. There's no wilderness. Now, I have a problem, don't, don't I? Because he, he, he was in Capernaum and he went into the solitary place, the wilderness. Where did, where did, where did he find the wilderness? I don't know. Could I throw out a suggestion? If you don't agree, don't, don't hammer me at the door. It's only a suggestion. Could it be that the Lord's satanic battle in the wilderness in verses 12 and 13 for 40 days and 40 nights, when he was alone with his father, it was a time of battle, it was a time of victory, it was a time of solitude, alone with his father. Could I suggest... It had such an impact that every time he prayed, he went mentally, psychologically back to that desert experience, that solitary place where it was just him and his father. Moses had a solitary wilderness experience. Forty years in Midian. John the Baptist had his solitary place living on locusts and wild honey. Paul had three years in the deserts of Arabia, according to Galatians 1.17. And I'm not a Moses. And I'm not a John or a Paul. But I, like you, have had those wilderness times when Satan attacked, when friends are few, when the Lord drew near, when it would have been easy to give up but the Lord sustained. And my, those are precious times. And many times in my prayer life, I go back to those moments and remember the faithfulness and the sustaining power of God. Matthew 6 and 6, When thou pray, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. Why shut the door? You mothers will know. Children are on, you never have a moment's peace. Huh? You can hardly go to the bathroom without them being there. They're always there. Where are you, mommy? Shutting the door locks us into God and locks the world out. It makes it a desert experience. Today we're bombarded with noise of social media Family demands, work pressures, society expectations. It's deafening, deafening. Shut the door. Shut the door. Lock the world out. And lock yourself into the Father. For times and privacy of prayer. So 
so that we might hear the still small voice like Elijah and Mount Horeb. You know, an umbrella doesn't stop the rain. What it does, it enables you to stand in the rain and overcome its impact. Prayer doesn't necessarily remove the storms of life, but it enables us to stand firm in the storms and overcome its impact. One boulder in, the priority of prayer Priority, power, privacy. Next week, God willing, we'll put another boulder in. The priority of preaching, reaching out. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we know that these things are familiar. But Father, we pray that it might stir our hearts in such a way that we will take prayer seriously, that we will know your nearness, that we will know your power, that we will know your leading and guiding and blessing in a way we haven't done up to this very moment, that we might be revived, that we might see our fellowship revived and our district revived and our nation revived. Father, help us to put the big boulders in first. For Christ's sake. Amen. We're turning to number 560 in the red book. And then please remain standing and we'll have a short word of prayer before we leave. Sweet hour of prayer.
forgive us for the times when prayer gets squeezed out because of the busyness of life. Father, we pray you'll bless each one gathered, all who are tuning in. You know the needs, the worries, the fears, the problems of each one. Father, minister in a way that only you can do. Encourage them this morning. And bless them. Be with us throughout the afternoon. And as we come to the gospel tonight, again we pray that your presence will fill the house. For Christ's sake. Amen.